quickly and and we we, we get alterations in in brain function and we've shown this across a variety of, di of different aspects and so what we've been trying to look at is trying to understand the uh, critical windows in in early life uh, how they can be shifted uh, in terms of brain microbiome interactions. It's very well studied in relation to neuroscience, but less so in relation to the microbiome. And we're beginning to see that the early life microbiome is going to be a critical pillar in understanding uh, the developmental origins of both health uh, and disease. And in relation to, to adolescence is, is an area where we're particularly interested in as well. We know all of these types of insults can affect the brain, but they also can affect the gut. And that's one of the things we've been really focusing on trying to understand and that relationship, whether it's alcohol, um, we've ongoing work in, in, in that area or poor nutrition in particular. And then the other term we've, we've coined here in Cork, it's a word that, that, that Ted Dynan and my colleague and myself came up with a few years ago, is psychobiotics, which means targeting the microbiome for mental health benefits. And we can do this through different ways, through different strains of bacteria, through different dietary substances, including fermented foods. And um, we, you know, we wrote this book about called The Psychobiotic Revolution, just to kind of introduce to the world uh, this whole idea that we could get better mental health and well-being uh, by targeting the microbes in the gut. Uh, and this is early days in this revolution, uh, but it is one. And at the same time, as we understand more about microbiome we're understanding more about um diet and and and, and the brain and the whole area of nutritional psychiatry is really taking off uh in different ways and we're beginning to appreciate the role of the microbiome in that and this is work we've ongoing now in Cork. kirsten is is a nutritionist in my team and she's we're trying to see can we triangulate the relationship between diet, microbiome and brain health and trying to understand can we sow the seeds for good mental health by targeting the diet which is targeting the microbiome because if you want to change your microbes diet is probably the best way to do that um, and one of the things we need to understand is the mechanisms and so that's kind of a lot of the work that we have in the APC Microbiome Ireland Centre. It's an SFI funded centre in UCC. And um, what Alejandro is going to be talking is about is, is, is elaborating on many of these ideas about how food can affect our brain, how genetics is playing a role and the microbiome. And Alejandro and his team have been the leaders uh, in, as Ken said, in uh, understanding the role of the microbiome in ADHD and have made some seminal findings over the past five years or so. Um, uh, really taking off. So the future is what is whether we can develop dietary um, interventions that will target the microbiome that will allow a, 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 us to affect the circuits in the brain uh, that are underlying many of the uh, uh, um, uh, aspects of, of, of mental health. So at that, I'm going to hand over to Alejandro and I look forward to hearing his talk. Thank you for the kind introduction, uh, John. It's, a, it's an honor. And thank you, Ken, for the kind invitation and to all the, the people here that decided to join us at this uh, time of, of the day. I hope that, that after this talk, uh, uh, some of these concepts are clear and, and you find the, the relevance and the importance of this, of this research. So, so let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, you can see the slides, I suppose. Okay. Indeed, you can. Um, thank you. Okay, so hopefully after we finish, uh, 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 you, you, we, I, we achieve these two objectives: that we understand this general concept of the microbiome gut-brain axis, and that we identify some modes of actions that, the, that this axis has on neuro neurodevelopmental disorders. I have three parts. It's a, it's quite a some information, so I will take it. I will take it easy, and as, as Ken said, just write the questions in the Q and A. And at the end, I think I will have time to go for, uh, over all of them. Uh, we have three parts, so I hope that we can go through through them uh, today. Um, so let's begin. Uh, I think it's important to to you know clarify some of the words and the concepts uh, because they tend to be used you know interchangeable. Um, so in order to, to you know, uh, eliminate sources of distraction, I think that we should focus on what, what is what. So the microbiota refers to the actual organisms, 
you know, this could be bacteria, but they also include viruses, fungi, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for the purpose of this conversation, we're going to use the word microbiota to refer to bacteria only. The word microbiome refers specifically to the genome of these organisms. And uh, uh, things that you might be more used to are, you know, the flora, microbial flora. They could be used as some sort of synonym of the microbiota. And basically, yeah, the, the microbiome, you think about genomes, genes. Now, the, John said it very clearly, uh, I mean, uh, microbes have been here way before us. And, and their study uh, in relation to our human health, to human health, it's, you know, millennia old. Now, this, this, this field, let's say, revamped thanks to a technique called uh, whole genome sequencing, which allows us to uh, identify and quantify bacteria that do, that do not need, uh, need, need oxygen to live, They're anaerobic bacteria. They're very difficult to culture. Therefore, we needed a way to actually know what these bugs were and how many we had. And, and the sequencing allowed us to, to do this. And the great revolution on applying this technique started around 10 years ago when, when the Human Genome Project and the meta projects you know, were basically launched and, and, and generated this huge amount of data and research that is now, that now we can see applied to almost everything. I will try to give you a short description of how, how relevant this research is right now. Now, going a little bit more into depth about the, the, general, the biological generalities of, of these bacteria, uh, there are a lot, a lot of them, and they live inside us, on top of us, in our skin, everywhere. We need them to live. We need them to function, right? They can be considered in an organism of their own altogether, and uh, their, com their biological complexity is extreme they are you know uh, there is a hundred times more genes in the bacteria than we have ourselves and still and we've been studying the genome for 20 years we're still scratching the surface so you can imagine that the level of complexity we are being faced we're facing with this is is, is tremendous now first contact we have with thing is when you're born and depending on, the, on on how you were born how your kids were born then you get different types of uh, you know, contact, the initial contact with the microbiota. Now, there are many, many ways to, to, to influence the microbiota. Uh, since you're born, your lifestyle has a lot to, to do with, with that, but also your genes, right? There is, a, there is a very important interaction between our genome, the host genome, and the bacterial genome, and not, not at the level of the genes, but at the level of the product of those genes. So what our genes produce interacts with what the genes of the bacteria produce. This interaction is that is what we actually use you know, to be able to function. From all these this determinants or, or let's say predictors of microbiota diversity, I will focus mainly on two for this, for this conversation, basically diet and aging. And this is in, you will see the importance of this throughout the, throughout the slides. Not to say that the other ones are not important, of course they are, but just to focus on these two uh, in order to you know, keep the story uh, going. So let's talk about a little bit about what the microbiota does. In general terms, the, the metabolic function of this bacteria is key for our own functioning in order to, to, to properly uh, uh, operate our system requires pro the product, the metabolic product of this bacteria. And the effect of this is all over the system. Uh, think about the immune system. The immune system is trained by uh, the microbiota. They are the ones who are you know, telling us what, what is good and what is bad in certain, in certain aspects, of course. They produce substances that we cannot produce. Uh, but also substances that we need to survive. So it's, it's key. So they, 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 what this means is that we have a very special relationship with this problem. It's what, what is called a, it's a symbiosis. So we give them food and shelter basically, and they give us all this very nice stuff that we need to, 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 to function. They promote key uh, uh, processes like you know, 
the, the, the generation of blood vessels, storage of fat, uh, energy production. And they also, of course, they also affect our brain. They're responsible for appetite. They affect mood. And of course, we now know that they have a very important and significant effect in the way your brain works. And that has multiple effects that will become more clear you know, throughout, the, throughout the book. Now, how does this work? How is it, how the gut communicates with the brain? Well, it, this is through something that is called the gut-brain axis. This is a very important bidirectional highway of communication. So very briefly, uh, there are around 500 million neurons in your enteric nervous system or your gut, right, in your intestines. And these cells are continuously picking up signals of everything basically that's happening down there. And they're sending those signals to the brain. On the other hand, the trillions of neurons that we have in our brain are also picking a lot of signals. And those that correspond are sent down to the gut. And this happens in microseconds all the time. It doesn't stop, right? Now, this is very important for our survival. Right? If we have an infection, that is our, our, micro, our microbes you know, help detect that, that information is sent to the brain. If we eat something that is not right, this feeling of nausea, you don't feel it in the gut, you feel it in your brain. And that information has to go very fast. This is key to survival. On the other hand, if you're feeling stressed, for example, if you're confronted with a stressful situation, if you're anxious, if you are under pressure, let's say, that those uh, feelings, the pressure that you're feeling is transmitted from your brain through your nerval, nerval communication to the gut. And that can ha have you know, significant effects in the, in, the, in the bacterial distribution. Now, there are multiple, uh, let's say, communications uh, between these two organs, but I will focus three that are you know, determinant for the gut-brain axis, axis to work. And they are, of course, amenable to change from the bacteria. Now, first is the activation of the, of the vagus nerve. And, and this is pretty important because the vagus nerve, it goes directly from the gut basically to the brain. It connects almost directly to the brain. And the amount of information that goes through this, through this uh, uh, bundle of nerves is incredibly high. Uh, the, let's say, type of signal can change depending on the uh, stimuli that the bacteria uh, give to this, uh, to this uh, nervous system. Um, the, the, the vagus nerve is embedded in the brain that is related to emotion. So uh, 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 it, is, it is quite relevant in order to, uh, as I said before, you know, have an effect on mood, for example. Also, the, 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 the effect that the microbiota has, uh, that has a direct effect on the brain is this education and stimulation of the immune system, right? We have, we have, let's say, two immune systems. One is the systemic one, and the other one is at the brain level that is regulated by specific cells of the brain. And those cells also require specific neurotransmitting neuro information from neurotransmitters or substances that actually allow cells to communicate at the brain level. And uh, the bacteria has the ability to actually activate signals, immune signals, that can have an effect directly on the brain. Now, third, is that, as I said before, the, uh, our, our, our friendly bugs, they produce specific substances that can be used, that are precursors and can be used at the brain level to create a specific neurotransmitters and uh, um, alter the kinetics of, of how this neurotransmission uh, occurs at the brain. I will go a little bit more in detail into that later. Now, how does this relate specifically to, let's say, neurodevelopment? Now, we know the brain and the gut talk. We know that this conversation is, is very fast, it's very strong, right? Um, but how exactly and where exactly in the brain is this happening? Well, we don't know yet, at, at least at the level of you know, neurodevelopmental disorders in humans. It is important to remember that there is a sort of uh, co-development between our brain, right? 
and our microbiota. Uh, and this is very important because age becomes one of the most important predictors or modifiers of microbial diversity together with diet. There are others, of course. Now, but more than this, more than this, let's say, biological co-development, right, is that we can think if we go at the beginning of life, right, early life, we could actually consider that the microbiota might be an important um, 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 determinant of how our, our brain is going to you know, develop and function in future. So the effects of, of bacteria already start in utero via the microbial uh, composition of the mother. Of course, at birth, you get your first, let's say, infection from this bacteria. And then there is a rapid development, very rapid development from the bacteria uh, through the first three or four years in life. Now, this is important because, of course, uh, 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 besides the fact that there are multiple factors that alter this, this diversity, you know, in uh, elderly in life, of course, the, the onset of neurodevelopmental disorders. Right? So, so the, the relevance here is, is can, can we then modulate, you know, the, the, the distribution of this bacteria in order to influence the risk of neurodevelopmental disorders? So this is a major question. A major question because it, it basically uh, tries to tap into multiple uh, key issues, you know, uh, early life, genetics, uh, um, lifestyle factors of early life, um, and has the opportunity to actually, if if if, if we can do this, to you know, modify, you know, the quality of life of people later in life. Now, all this, all this information or all this, let's say, rationale that, that we have, you know, uh, with the help of, of many, many researchers, will help us to develop this, this idea, this general hypothesis that, that, that the, the way our brain works and the way, the, the way our brain functions uh, is the result, at least partially, is the result of this interaction between our bacteria and our genome. So the genome of the bacteria and the gene on our own genome. And that, that interaction functions through the gut-brain axis, altering or modifying the way your brain is working. And this is pretty deep in the sense that when you think about neurodevelopmental disorders, you, you, you kind of get stuck in the brain. And what this means basically, right, is that, that we should, uh, this is our aim, is that we should, uh, look at you know the genome we should look at, at, at the brain also we should also look at diet we should also look at the microbiota uh, it's basically that we should look at the system instead of get, being focused completely or only in the brain this is a major shift this is a major paradigm shift when you think about neurodevelopmental disorders now <clears throat> we need to we need to to remember that neurodevelopmental disorders are highly genetic now this has been uh, this, this described multiple times. This is very robust. We know that the the genetic load, let's say, of both ADHD and autism spectrum disorders are is very high, very very high. So the question is, okay, if these things are genetic, let's say, what's the point? Well, as I as I, as I told you, this the, the the what we are what we're proposing is that this is the result of an interaction. Because what we know now is that even though that the things like ADHD or autism are, are highly genetic in, in terms of you know, what explains them, we know that the genes alone are not able to explain everything. It's a little bit counterintuitive. But what, what we're saying is that it's not the, the, the genes alone, but the genes in interaction with something else. And what we're pr proposing is that part of that interaction includes the microbiota effect. There are other, other environmental effects like lifestyle, you know, et cetera. But we are uh, arguing that the microbiota is now a, a hub, you know, that includes the effects of diet, of lifestyle, and others. Everything or most of these other de environmental determinants go through the microbiota or alter the microbiota in some way, meaning that the, those changes will, again, through the gut brain axis, go up to the brain. So again, as a, as a matter of you know, 
context, mm -hmm. we also need to, to, to remember that yes, this, these disorders are genetic, but they are multifactorial, meaning that there is a, a huge, uh, let's say, non-genetic component that goes beyond the microbiota. So this is the point I wanted to make. There are other environmental factors, and we argue that those effects also go through the bacteria and, 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 and modify the, the way these, these bacteria grow and live and interact with each other. You can imagine when we're talking about thousands and thousands of species <clears throat> confined to a very small space, um, the degree that the complexity of the interactions is tremendous. And I wonder if we would ever be able to understand that completely. Um, uh, so the, the challenge is great, but it's also quite, uh, quite uh, interesting and, and, and important to, to investigate. Now, so, so let's, let's, let's say summarize a little bit here because it's important to remember then that the diet is, is, is a very important determinant on, on how the, you know, the, the, the bacterial distribution presents, how it grows, how it changes through time, through life, through lifestyle, lifespan. It's not the same when you are five, six year old, then you become a teenager, you start drinking alcohol, you start smoking, then you become older, you change your diet, maybe you go and live somewhere else, you change your diet there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So all these, all these changes are pretty important, right? We know, of course, that diet, and this has also been reported and now more and more, first in, in using animal models, but now in, in, in humans, more and more reports are coming out about the you know, very robust associations that a specific diet might have in the risk of uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, right? Um, so what we want to what we want to do is we want to close, and you saw the, the, the triangle that I'm going to show. What we're doing is we try to answer the question: bacteria modify that risk. Going back to the original question that I <clears throat> posed at the beginning of the, of the talk, and this is important because we can't change the microbiota. We cannot change our genes, right? But we can change the microbiota profile. I will show examples of that. But let's say, to keep it simple, you can change your diet and your microbiota profile will, will, will shift, right? From a, fat, you know, a high fat diet, for a, you change that to a veggie diet, more veggie diet, then your microbiota profiles will change, right? That has been you know, multiple, shown multiple times with you know, robustness. And it's, it's, it's very clear. So we want, to, we, want to, we want to answer this question here because this we can change. Right, and this 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 determines the biology of this. Now we can change the microbiota by changing this, right? But this effect here will not explain everything here, so that's why we need a triangle. Now, when you think about neurodevelopmental disorders, you're also thinking about uh, a clinical construct or a, a definition that is, is extremely complex, right? Not everybody is the same, and the way that these disorders are characterized is very heterogeneous. Therefore, one of the uh, approaches that we use in our research is that, and, and we learned this from, from the work we've, doing, we've been doing in genetics for the last 10 years, is that you can look at these this clinical constructs and, and try to, to deconstruct them in their uh, fundamental parts. Um, uh, if we, if we, we can agree, I think that we cannot agree that, that Neurodevelopmental disorders have a brain component, they have a genetic component, and they have a behavior component, right? Um, they overlap, but they also have unique features. So we could actually investigate the effects of microbiota, not only in this construct, in this, in this let's say, diagnosis or whatever, but also in these component parts, these component phenotypes, and component measures. And that gives us certain advantages because then you can look, instead of looking at groups of clinical measures, you can look at, you know, the distributions of, you know, behavior or genetics. And that, that offers uh, uh, advantages in terms of that these measurements are less noisy. They're more stable, they're easy, easier to collect, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what I'd, I, I would like to remind you that when you talk about diet, you need to remember that not all diets have the, the, the same effect all the time, you know, it, it, it also depends on where you're living, if you live in an urban area or in a rural area, if, 
if it's winter, if it's summer, if you live, you know, uh, close to the equator or up north or up down south. You know, it depends on how you sleep, right? There is a because the way you sleep on how, how much time you sleep also has a very significant effect on the way your brain is working, how susceptible it is to multiple other issues. So I, I just wanted to point out that there are multiple other factors besides lifestyle that can also affect the way diet can influence microbiota or can affect, uh, or that these factors can affect microbiota directly. <clears throat> so here I'm going to take some time to show you this. This would be an example of how we could use all of this information I just gave you. And this is more or less a design and more global design that, that we are trying to, to also apply in our own research. So if you look at the, at the, the top of the, of the figure of the cartoon, you know, imagine that you have a group of people that are you know, eating whatever they eat. You know, there's a, a distribution in, the, in their diet of, of whatever type, right? Now, what you can do is you can try to classify people based on, on a specific response, let's say, or a specific change or a specific grouping, but base and then compare what, what their dietary profile is and see if there's already a difference. At the same time, you can actually investigate if there's any difference at the, the distribution of, them, of their bacteria. And then if these two different if these two responses here, they, they are, let's say, linked or associated, then you could actually suggest specific dietary uh, uh, interventions or dietary strategies that you know, favor one particular group because they perform better, they're healthier or whatever, but based on you know, what is happening at the bacterial level. So you use this to identify that which is very clever because uh, finding these differences might not be so easy, but measuring this might. Now, you can also use this information to actually go specific, specifically to individuals and then use this information to then predict in the future and protect people, for example, if they have higher risk of you know, diabetes, for example. But you can also think about you know, things happening at the brain level. So this is a more or less general uh, uh, design that, that, that we're, trying to, we're trying to implement because this is, this is quite complicated. And the reason this is complicated is because estimating this part, so you know, there, our dietary habits is very difficult. So you can, you can send people questionnaires and ask them what do you eat. And you have a more or less okay -ish uh, 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 quantification of what people eat. But if you really want to know, you actually need to do a proper formal nutritional, nutritional study. And that is way more complicated because you need to actually determine the amount of energy, you know, the different types of substances, vitamins, minerals, how much salt, how much sugar, how much, how much fat, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, convert that to grams or to some quantifiable measure and then convert that to energy. So it's really complicated, really, really complicated. And you need to do it in large numbers. Huh? Uh, why? Why is large numbers? Because the effects of diet, even through, at the microbiota level and that, or, you know, whatever biology to, let's say, the brain, those effects, they need to be small. Think about it. Imagine if you went for, for holiday, I don't know, to Southeast Asia or you know, South Africa or somewhere in Latin America where, where the diet is really radically different from what you're used to eating, right? And then do, exposing yourself to that, to that diet. Imagine if the, the, that, the effect of diet would be that strong at your brain level. If you went for a holiday after a couple of weeks then you start to behaving differently. That doesn't happen, right? These are very small cum cumulative effects, you know, that happen through time. So therefore, determining the, the actual effects of diet you know, via the microbiota or directly into the individual, you require a lot of people. And we're trying to do that, but doing that, it's quite costly and timely, and, you know. Um, but still, we need to do it. Ideally, we would like to end by having a, a sort of intervention approach, a treatment approach, something that helps you know, pharmacological, typical pharmacological approaches 
that sometimes are very difficult to, uh, to adhere to. <clears throat> Sorry, and what we expect is that, that by finding this, this intervention or treatment strategies, that we might contribute to, you know, adherence to the more, you know, the more mainstream pharmacological treatments, perhaps reducing them and combining them with a better diet or something like that. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet, but we're working very hard towards that. Now, the question is, of course, okay, which diet, right? I get this question many, many, many times. Now, uh, we don't have it yet. It doesn't exist. Right? There is no ADHD diet, okay? Um, <clears throat> there are recommendations about eating healthy, and eating healthy is good for you overall, including your brain. So it's always better to eat healthy. I know it sounds silly, but it, it is true, right? Um, the best research so far in terms of um, intervention strategies uh, that use diet is something called the restriction elimination diet. We are uh, carrying out a clinical trial uh, on, on that respect that we hope to have ready this year. <clears throat> um, so I cannot tell you if it works or not. I'm, I can tell you that our research looks promising, uh, but more than that, I can't tell you. Um, and this is, the, let's say, the most robust, scientific, unbiased attempt to describe dietary nutritional effects on ADHD. This is the only one. Now, <clears throat> this, it, it is important also to think that the, the say, the, the logistics of eating and cooking and preparing meals, it's also very important, you know, as a, as a sort of routine, as a sort of a behavioral aid, you know, to keep people focused, to keep them, you know, concentrated in something that is good for you, also at, at the systemic level. But this can be a challenge. And sometimes people get frustrated and, and it's boring and I want to cook for myself. And, and then choices are made to eat something that is easy. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to put much effort in it. And that, and that food choices are not good for you, right? Which also, of course, goes against this idea that eating healthy is good for you. It could be good for ADHD, for example, right? And it could potentially help with the symptomatology. This means that we need to answer the question, is it, is it the diet or is it the cooking? And that is, that is important because, because uh, having a routine that is good for you, that is nice to do, for example, could help also in the management of certain behaviors. Now, <clears throat> to, to, to finalize the, 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 the talk, I will show you a couple of examples of the work we, we carry out um, that I hope that I pick your interest. There are many other things that we're doing, but I want to just I want to show you two and then talk a little bit about one of the big projects we're carrying out. Um, so we have we have two main questions that we're trying to answer with our with our research, right? So first of all, is is there a shared pattern uh, at the microbiota level uh, between you know in in people with with uh, ADHD or, or autism spectrum disorder. Why is this important? Because you need to remember that we don't have a biological marker for things like ADHD. It, it, it's not that, that we go to you know, the GP and, and they take blood and, and they say, okay, this, this, this enzyme here or this thing here is higher or lower. And okay, yeah, well, this indicates that uh, that doesn't exist, not for ADHD. So we lack a biological marker, robust, predictive biological marker. We don't have it. So, so we want to determine if we can use the microbiota as a biological marker for the disease. And this would be like revolutionary for many, in many ways because you can collect them, the bacteria, you can uh, analyze it, sequence it, identify what, it is, what there is there, quantify it, and then <clears throat> uh, calculate risk, for example. This is very important. You could do that very early, 
a very very early age. You can combine that with the genetic information. We can you can combine that with you know, behavioral information, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and create a profile. And this that could be very informative and very helpful. And then the second one it's a more more of a biological nature because we want to know what's going on. We want to we want to know how uh, and where in the brain the microbiota is exerting its effect. Of course, that offers uh, 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 the possibility of understanding better what kind of uh, physiology are we looking at at the brain level. We want to understand because uh, there are, if, if, if you think about you know, things like, like KDC or autism spectrum disorder, or you can think about other, other things like you know, OCD or ODD or these kind of things. Uh, uh, there is on, an on underlying factor, you know, and this factor is behavior. There, is, there are changes in behavior that characterize each of these, these disorders. So by looking at the brain, we can uh, uh, aid in the understanding of that, those variations at the behavior level. And it's easier to look at behavior than, again, it's easier to look at this, this underlying factor than to look at different groups. By looking at this underlying factor, we can combine instead of looking at them separately. So we want to understand the biology. In order to do that, we, we have this, this, this notion of how would this work uh, uh, to, answer, to answer these questions. We're basing our answer in a, in a, a, a biological assumption is that whatever the, 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 the bacteria produces down here in the blue part, you know, they, produ they produce specific um, the building blocks of neurotransmitters. These substances we don't we don't produce ourselves, right? So we need our diet and we need our bacteria to get them. And this this these are building blocks that go through the blood to the brain. And the whole idea is that in the brain they can modify the kinetics, the the, the way this uh, uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin or dopamine or adrenaline are produced. So so that has great implications because if we because this thing we can change down here so in theory by changing this we can modify what happens at the brain level and that is that is the that is the whole idea now it's easier said than done of course <laughs> and we need to determine how this happens how this this transfer happens specifically can we measure it can we determine you know, rates of transfer, can we, can we see, is the system efficient or not? What happens at the brain level, right? It's not that we can go at, you know, inside people's brains and measure stuff, right? We cannot do that. So we use, we use animals for this, right? Um, animals are very useful, but of course there has, it has a lot of limitations, you know? Um, so this, this, is, this is a very interesting idea, but it's very difficult to execute. So we're slowly progressing with this. Now, this is just an example of one of the papers we published recently where we try to find if there were a pattern, a shared pattern, or a different pattern in people with ADHD versus, versus control and the microbial level. So we, we collected the, the fecal sample, we extracted the bacterial DNA, we sequenced it, and then we basically compared it. We cleaned it, we, we did all cleaning steps of the data, and then we compared it between, between groups. Right, we accounted for the effect of you know age and gender, BMI. Unfortunately, we didn't have information on diet here. <clears throat> this was one of our initial works, but we did have information on medication use, for example. Um, we, we determined, for example, that there was less variability in the group with ADSD versus the group without ADSD. <clears throat> and we found, for example, oh, sorry, we found in interesting associations between specific bacteria groups and behavior. <coughs> Sorry. But again, this is this is association studies, this is statistics. But this is very interesting because it's all opening, you know, the, the, the door, you know, in order to, to motivate uh, other researchers and funding agencies to give us more money and to keep on looking at this increasing our sample size, inviting more people to participate and, and, and help us uh, um, discover what, what is the, the pattern 
that, that explains this difference. Now, <clears throat> importantly, that, <coughs> that by identifying these groups, we are, or, or well, microbiologists basically can then figure out what these bacterial groups are doing by characterizing the bacteria, sequencing their genes, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Sorry. Another, another example I wanted to show you was that we, we wanted to answer the question, well, how would the bacteria affect you know, the development of you know, brain and behavior uh, in this case of animals? If, if we think that the bacteria, if we think that our hypothesis is correct and that the bacteria have an effect on the brain level, if we actually uh, uh, transplanted the bacteria from people with ADHD to animals, and we compare that to <clears throat> the same experiment, but done with the bacteria of people without ADHD, we expect to see differences. Well, that's exactly what we did. <coughs> we took the, 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 the bacteria from, from a group of patients and, and controls, and, and we, we infected some, some mice, some, some very nice control mice, and then we, met, we, we basically observed what happens in terms of their behavior, in terms of their brain uh, development. And the two main findings came out. One is that the, the animals in, uh, that received the bacteria from, from ADHD, people with ADHD, were more anxious, more frightful. They didn't move as much, which is interesting. And uh, uh, when we looked at the brains, the, the way the brains were wired, the structure of the brains of these animals was different in those, in those animals that, that received the bacteria from people with ADHD compared to the other group showing less, let's say, a, 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 a lesser connectivity between, between specific regions of, of, of the brain. Now, I, I, want, I, 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 I focus on this finding specifically, uh, not only because, of course, the statistics point towards this bacteria being you know, very different between, between the two groups, but because we also found the same, the same bacteria when uh, the, in the human study. Then uh, uh, our, our colleagues, uh, our colleagues of ours, actually investigated the sequence of the bacteria that we found, and, and, and they found that this this bacteria named here is is involved in the production or the consumption, I would say, of, of GABA. And GABA is a major uh, neurotransmitter. Um, so so this is pretty interesting. Again, this is. Still, we need to replicate this. We need to find it again through other studies. <clears throat> but the interesting thing is that what we're finding makes sense in terms of our initial hypothesis that you know, differences in the microbiota can be linked to differences in the brain, and that that those that that, that this pattern is different in people is different in people with ADHD compared to people without ADHD. Now, <clears throat> what does this mean? It's very complicated, uh, um, but um I think that we that we need to to let's say go deeper into into the research of the effects of bacteria in brain because as I said before, this really shifts the paradigm in terms of how we understand or we will understand what's going on and and more importantly, it will help us you know uh, come up with better solutions to to you know people with ADHD. Things that go beyond the clinical or the pharmacological intervention that gives people more control on how they basically uh, take take you know decisions about about their own lives, right? Um, it can help us understand risk a little bit more. You know, we we can identify now specific genetic risks. But these are very small, and they explain a little, very small portions of this risk. So ideally, we would like to have more information as early in life as possible. And of course, we can understand better the biology, hopefully, at, at least at the brain level, but not exclusively of the brain, but also the other parts of the system. Um, for example, if uh, things that come, come to mind 
uh, very easily neuroinflammation, so in, in inflammatory processes that uh, might affect uh, the way your brain is working. And these these inflammatory processes are, you know, cumulative. They happen through life. It could be related, for example, with the uh, 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 metabolism of glucose um, um, or the metabolism of energy, let's say. So, so uh, we go outside the brain now. We can go outside the brain and learn also about the biology of neurodevelopmental disorders. My, studies of the microbiome allow us to do that. It could help us, of course, look at diet as a, a complement to uh, current pharmacological treatments and perhaps improve them, right? Um, uh, using things, for example, like probiotics. And I guess that many of you noticed that I did, this is the first time I mentioned probiotics in POC. And that was done on purpose because we don't have the information about probiotics working for ADHD or autism, right? So I don't want to confuse you with that, uh, but I wouldn't, would be very clear that we don't have evidence they have an effect. Therefore, um, we are studying them, and I will, I will talk about that later. Uh, <clears throat> but more, more specifically, perhaps we can identify specific dietary interventions that help at least a, a subgroup of people that are more sensitive to, this, to these dietary interventions, to these dietary exposures. And that as such would be like uh, extremely important um, for the way people manage uh, manages their own their own life. So with all, all that in mind, I, I would like to leave you with this this updated aim of our research, because it's not only the interaction of multiple biological factors with the bacteria or the genome of the bacteria, but also uh, we need to take into account our dietary intake and, of course, uh, how diet changes uh, according to other, you know, environmental factors, cultural factors, and especially, of course, our lifestyle. Now, uh, here, uh, briefly, I want to do a little bit of self-promotion. Um, uh, I want to talk to you about a project I coordinate that is called Eat to Be Nice. And the results that I show you today and the 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 the, 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 say the rationale we discussed they <clears throat> are stemming partially from this project. This is a European consortium uh, um, that investigates the effect of nutrition as a driver of, of behavior and cognition. Um, in this in this project, we have four clinical trials that are ongoing that are investigating the restriction elimination diet, as I said, probiotics, nutritional supplements. Uh, so, so uh, it's pretty comprehensive in that sense. Of course, it's huge. Uh, it's a huge field. Uh, um, so, but, uh, of course, we're not looking at everything in the clinical trials, but I think we're we're looking at very important uh, um, dietary factors. We also are doing a lot of work in terms of finding robust associations in the population between specific dietary factors and the behavior. We have access to huge data repository where millions and millions of data points <clears throat> and the first uh, scientific reports are coming out. Um, I encourage you to visit the webpage so you can visit the blog section and you can find out in, in very you know, uh, clear terms, very easy to follow all the aspects of the project and the advances that we're doing uh, 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 with regards to different research areas that we're covering. It to be nice also offers the possibility to interact with you know, multiple uh, research groups inside the Netherlands, but also around the world. Uh, it, it works with uh, you know, specific projects early in life, but also late in life. Uh, that, is a, that is a population that we can tend to overlook specifically when talking about things like ADHD. Uh, we work with clinicians, we work with patient organizations, Hopefully we can put ADC Ireland also here soon. Uh, we also work with multiple uh, other research studies, uh, consortia all over the world uh, in order to keep this going. We, we don't stop, we, we keep moving. We, we try to get as much money as we can. This is very expensive work. Um, um, 
and it only works basically uh, because of participation with people like you. Uh, uh, without your input, without your, uh, you know, your discipline and your generosity, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So I want to thank you all, and I want to recommend for those of you who are interesting. This might be a little bit difficult. I don't know, but they are very, very good papers. Um, they they are very, very comprehensive, <clears throat> and 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 I think that that they could give you a lot of information if you are if you're really interested in going deep into this. They describe the biology, they describe you know, the science, and they describe many other aspects that, that are important to know. Uh, with that, I think we're done. Again, I want to thank you for your time, for being here, uh, for you know, sharing. Thank you. That's all from my side. Okay, thanks very much for that, Alexandra. We really appreciate it. Um, so it from our perspective, as you know, Lady HD Ireland, it's, it's new and interesting information that hasn't been made available to people in Ireland before. Um, but just be, before we go to questions, um, John, do you have any um, insights or comments you'd like to add to the presentation? Um, well, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was just great. It, it, it captured so much of, about where we are. And um, I guess one of the comments I have, uh, it's more a comment, is, 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 is managing expectations um, overall in terms of where we are. Like, you know, we use words like revolution and, you know, it's it's changing things but but it's still very early days um uh overall and i think a lot of the um the facts are, are we're just beginning to to to, to get there so you know it, it, it is but it, once we start remembering that the microbes were there first then it's not so surprising uh that everything else is is is, 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 is being regulated by this but i thought uh you know i thought Alejandro was did was very fair in terms of positioning where we are in the field but it really is just about managing expectations and getting more um uh, research being done and more people uh, engaged in research, uh, basic research to, to, that will form the foundations about where we want to go with this. Um, and I think that's, you know, that that's really important. Okay, yeah. thanks very much. Yes, I, I completely agree with that. And, and I, I, I made a slide about the diet, especially because this is the recurrent question that I, I keep getting. What should I give my child? Um, and this is, the answer is based on that, what you just said, John, we need to manage the expectations. The need is, is great, uh, but we're not there yet. We're working very hard and that is something that we also need to tell people. We're working very hard, um, uh, but we're not there yet. So yeah, okay. managing expectations indeed. And um, I say there is a ton of questions there in the Q&A at the minute, which is great. And obviously just what we'll do is we'll go around the team here from ADH Island um, and we we'll take them out and we'll put them to you. Um, but I, um, one of the first ones I saw and I, I particularly liked is it's something I have been thinking about and I, I was actually looking to get the answer myself and it's from Rochelle and it's saying a percentage of kids with ADHD will also have celiac disease. Do you think it may be possible that celiac disease being an autoimmune condition affecting the microbiome and then causing ADHD or is it the ADHD affecting the microbiome and possibly triggering uh, celiac disease? I've heard that come up before in conversations, so I thought it'd be a good one to throw out there too. Okay, so yes, there is a, a sort of, I don't know if it's, you could we could call official like comorbidity between celiac disease and ADHD. Mm. I, I know anecdotally that there are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, issues with sensitivity to food in, in, in ADHD. I also know that uh, epidemiologically speaking, there is a higher risk of uh, higher BMI, obesity in children with ADHD. And this can all be the result of specific sensitivities or even uh, allergies or uh, this kind of processes. The causality, the causality wheel is, is, at least for me, is not known. Um, but in my opinion, and given what I know a little bit about genetics, I would say that there is a shared genetic component that links both uh, um, our, our sensitive sensitivity to, to food given specific genetic risk factor and that shared genetic factor increases the risk for ADHD. That would be my uh, answer at this moment. Um, <clears throat> that sensitivity to food generates, of course, that our microbiota will be different. Um, 
So I, I, I wouldn't know how to answer the, the, the causality question. Okay, well, great question. What I know is that there are some attempts, I don't know, John, if you know, of trying to minimize the effects of extreme cases of irritable bowel diseases by the use of fecal transplant. And that those trials have shown quite promising results. Mm -hmm. But these are really, really extreme, extreme cases. Well, thanks very much for that. Um, um, just do the next question for Nicola, but um, as typical with normal Nicola, um, you need to unmute yourself before you can ask the question. I'm here. Thanks, Alexander. We're, that's a really interesting. Um, it was a really interesting talk, and we've learned a lot. But there's a girl here, and she um, is kind of one close to my heart as well. Uh, Laura Murray is actually asking, um, does a C-section birth um, impact the level of first infection due to the lack of exposure to the birth canal? Yes. So, uh, oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it, it, this is something that we work on, on in, in Cork um, uh, a lot. And um, so C-section, it's now been well shown that C-section uh, does lead to a very different early microbiome. Uh, there is, um, we have a project at the moment where, where we're looking at this called missing microbes. Uh, the mimic, it's about missing microbes. And so, but it's not only what's missing, what we're now beginning to understand is also what's, what is actually blooming in its replace. So it's been known for over a decade now that C-section does lead to um, a different microbiome in early life. But like C-section is a life-saving surgical intervention. So we need to be looking at uh, ways to mitigate the effects of C-section. And so that's one of the things that, that, that there's a lot of research into now, if it can be used as, um, and also because C-section breastfeeding rates are less uh, even in C-section. So, so, you know, we, 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 we breastfeeding has its most effect on the microbiome, positive effect on the microbiome uh, in C-section um, born infants because the, the, it, there's more room for it to actually have a positive effect. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're looking at trying to look at ways to, 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 to bring back these microbes that are missing uh, because in, in some of our studies, uh, we do find enduring effects. Uh, we, we did some studies where we stressed people in the lab uh, and, and those that were born by C-section had a greater uh, stress levels. Um, and we're just getting ready to publish that. Uh, so there is there's definitely something there, especially as T-section rates, you know, have doubled in Ireland and since yeah. since, since 1990. Um, so it, 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 it is important, but we have to be careful. The last thing we want to do is, is, is you know, people uh, overinterpret what some of this in terms of blaming uh, their ob obstetric histories or, or various other things. So, so um, but it is, it is, the first thousand days is critical. Uh, and that's, you know, it, 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 for, for both brain development that and for microbial development and so when they're not synced up things can can go wrong i, I would look just to add that, that uh, there has been a lot of epidemiological research done uh in terms of the association between c-section and adhd so far it's not not really a factor as far as i can remember uh we so, we, we, there is some some data. We, we we had one epidemiology study, Alejandro, yeah. with colleagues in, in uh, where the, the, there was some links, uh, especially in elective C-section. But it, but it's still very you know there's so many other factors to take into account. I, I just wanted to point out that, that that this shows the type of complexity we're facing because it is quite clear that the effects on the microbiota are significant and very strong. But in terms of something like ADHD, which is so complex then it becomes more complicated to say yes or no. Okay, well, okay. thanks very much. Um, and obviously just just say from our perspective, you know, just looking at the interaction there between the two of you. And um, from our perspective, you know, we've got the two world leaders talking about the subject of passing on the information. So from our perspective, this is great. Um, just moving on, just uh, um, Hannah has the next question. And just in terms of, you know, Hannah's only joined us a couple of months, uh, but Hannah's actually the one who's actually read a book on the micro by um, so. And um, only one the obviously know something about it before we actually did the, the webinar tonight. Yeah, um, the psychobiotic revolution, which John was talking about at, at the start. Um, so firstly, thanks Alejandra and John for for this evening, and thank you everyone who's attending. Um, this one is kind of similar to Laura's question that Nicola just read out. Um, well, it's touching on motherhood and microbiome. So an anonymous attendee is asking, have you come across any mothers who have autoimmune diseases whose child has ADHD? 
No, uh, personally, I, I don't look at, at, at I don't look at it in that way. So mm -hmm. so perhaps I should have explained that a little bit better. I, I don't work with people uh, in that sense. I'm not a clinician. I, I don't see patients. I don't see mothers. So so we don't we don't look at that. Um, so no, I I I don't know. Um, um, yeah, you put me on the spot there. I haven't I haven't seen it. We haven't looked at that question actually. Maybe it's a good question that we should start looking at from our from our side. John, do you have anything to say about that? Um, the, I I. I... No, no, there's no data. I mean, the thing is, everything is possible uh, because the, the microbes are, 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 can be changed by many things. And most disease states and most autoimmune disease states will modify the microbes. Um, the other thing that will modify them is the medications that you're on. So, so um, there, is, there, there is lots of scope there, but I haven't seen any good data to link that uh, together. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but it, I, I, I haven't seen it uh, uh, out there yet. Oh, thanks very much for that. Um, and obviously, just yeah, as I was saying, you know, it's great to have the world experts here. It was great having great questions coming in from an Irish international audience here today as well. Um, what I would say is, you know, we've been doing these public events and webinars obviously since last March, and I don't think I've ever seen 34 questions in the Q and A. So, um, if we're going to get out of here by half eight, we better get through a few more of them. So, uh, I think Terry has the next question. Yeah. So from Fearon, um, great talk. Thank you. And great to hear from John too. In regards to bacteria that you identified as associated with ADHD, do you have data on what kind of foods diet it would be associated with? And also you mentioned, I think, GABA. Do you know its role on a physiological level? Yeah, uh, no, the first part of the, of the question, no. We, we, we were not able to, to collect that information at that time when we were running the study. Um, the reason we couldn't do that was because when I was starting that research line here, um, I asked one of my uh, uh, colleagues here that he was running the, the study on, on, on ADHD. And I said, look, I have this brilliant idea, right? That I think it's gonna solve every problem. Uh, <laughs> do you let me, can I get access to this study and invite uh, the people participating you know, to donate and he said, yes, except you cannot ask them anything, anything. So I agree that you ask them if they want to donate their feces, but that's it. Because these studies are very burdensome for the people that participate. Perhaps some, some of you have already participated, I don't know, but they are very burdensome. People have to do a lot. And again, as I said before, this is, they, these studies only work because people are so generous. Um, so I we cannot yet pinpoint specific dietary interventions with, with the with the uh, variation in terms of relative abundance or quantity, let's say, of a specific bacteria species uh, uh, in in re, in the context of ADHD. Uh, I think it would be very difficult to do that because this is an ecosystem, so things change. And the way we measure them, it's, it's, it's as I said, in relative abundance. So if something grows, something else needs to go down. I mean, there's uh, still a little bit of issues on how we measure bacteria and statistically. Um, I, I won't go into that. But no, I don't, I, I cannot pinpoint, I cannot give you that answer. GABA, GABA is, uh, yeah, GABA is a rock star basically in the brain. Uh, uh, and it's involved in, in, in key uh, 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 brain functions. Um, GABA is related also with dopamine. Uh, physiology is uh, related with, let me think. But it's I... the main, it's the main, it's the main inhibitory. It's the main neurotransmitter we have for shutting down things in the brain. So when you have, yeah. a, it, it, uh -huh. it, it's really what we want to, we want to do uh, to, to, to shut, shut things down. But uh, and I, I think they're really cool findings on Alejandro, but do you think the GABA is getting into the brain from uh, the periphery? Because that's where. No, I don't think so. I, I mean, the big molecules, I don't think they go through the blood yeah. and back. I think it's the, 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 the cursors or at least some of them might go in. And um, yeah, not the big molecules now. Yeah, they kind of go. Okay, right. thanks for that. You heard it here tonight, the big molecules don't go through the membrane. And um, we'll get that explained later, maybe at the next one. Um, I'm going to launch a very quick poll for people, just it'll take you 15 seconds. If you were just to uh, click on that while you're listening in, would be great. 
Um, and just while you're doing that, uh, Trisha has the next question. Hi, yeah, this is a question from Terry. She says, I know research is at an early stage, but I was just wondering if there are any trends towards foods that should be avoided or that may be particularly helpful. John's nodding his head there. Okay, John, you go ahead. Okay, okay. So, yes. Um, there, there, and again, there's been not an, enough data done in ADHD populations yet or in various neurodiverse populations. But what we do know, and this is the advice that I generally give, is that the, the, there are things we should be taking uh, more of, uh, fiber. If you can tolerate it, you should really up your fiber. Fiber is the king. It's what the bacteria love. Uh, and uh, we're really bad in Ireland. Our fiber intake is just really bad. Fermented foods um, are, are really good for your bacteria. Uh, like uh, kefir, like this, I call them the three Ks, kefir, kombucha, and kimchi, uh, but also yogurt, sauerkraut, uh, you know, fermentation is getting a new thing. Culturally in Ireland, we're really bad uh, uh, and we think about it as expensive and, and um and one of the things we need to do and that i'm quite passionate about is that the type of solutions we come up with in relation to dietary solutions that we have to be they have to be democratized so that they're going to affect uh, all socioeconomic groups so we don't just want to create solutions that are going to work only in people who can go to uh, health food stores or whatever else but like the the um the the, the um Fermented foods cost not like 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 kefir costs nothing except the, the the cost of milk if you make it yourself. You just need the grains and you make milk. And I have it every day. And it's 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 one of these things where you, you put it in with yogurt or fruit or something to make it a little bit more uh, palatable or whatever else. But it's, but but that's really good. So fibers and fermented foods. And we just did a study in Cork uh, where uh, in 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 um, people who are stress sensitive uh, and have bad diets, and we changed their diet for one month. So one not a long-term study and we found that their stress levels and depression scores and everything went down dramatically and so by adding fiber and fermented foods we could really see changes uh, in people and i think that's the, the that's what the microbes are doing. They're, they're really benefiting from that. Um, the things that, that, that we also know, omega-3 omega fatty acids are good for your microbes. And, and any foods, foods, rainbow colors, look for color. Mm -hmm. Colors contain uh, polyphenols are, are, are really good. They're present in green tea, but uh, um, they're, they're in, in dark chocolate and, 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 and red wine, but all so in grape juice and onions so uh but they're really good for for, for the microbiome because they, they they can go to your whole colon and they, the the microbes actually act on them there um and 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 we know a lot about them and and and, and their activity things to avoid is also becoming quite clear processed food is evil for your microbiome so a lot of the the, the, the chemicals in processing food uh, is what's really bad for the microbiome sweeteners artificial sweeteners would you believe that they can be pretty bad for your microbiome you think you might be doing good by taking the the, the diet coke well maybe it's doing worse than the full thing in terms of what's going on uh, sugars in general um uh, and you know in our book we, we created this this pyramid of, of what would be good for, for 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 the microbiome and so so you you know, red meat and too much red meat is bad, but you know, uh, uh, everything in moderation and plenty of diversity. Like everything that we know uh, uh, in life, diversity is, is, is what's really good uh, overall. Um, our, our, again, yeah, the, 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 the link between diet and ADHD is still in its infancy. One of the findings we've, we've detected is that the, the use of sugar uh, might have an effect on, 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 on the risk of ADHD, right? We're working on that data. This is an epidemiological finding, so we don't, we don't know exactly the complete picture, but the biology seems to, to work through the microbiota. So, so yeah, and, and of course, this, this can be confounded by many other factors. I mean, if you drink sugary, sugary drinks, it means probably that you eat in a certain way or you live in a certain way, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's 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 not only one factor. It's not only one thing, right? The way you eat, it's correlated with the way you live, the way you know how you work, et cetera, et cetera. So it's um, it's it's complex. But I, sugar, processed sugar, probably it's not a very good idea. Okay. Well, thanks so much. I say we will try and get through many questions we can. And um, obviously, just we've uh, closed the polling there. So um, good news for Alexandro. 30% uh, thought it was brilliant, 50% uh, thought it was very good, so good high scores there for you. And in terms of I got all the science, um, 
Yes was 27%, I understood it all. Got most of it, 69%, and only 4% said it hurt my brain. So congratulations on delivering the <laughs> results that made it all sense for everybody. And uh, we'll share them now. But while they're doing Thank that, um, just seeing if uh, Nicola has the next question. Um, uh, well, yeah, I have one more. Um, will, uh, who is this? Uh, Teresa. Uh, Teresa's asking, um, will the sterile environment that we live in now um, cause a problem with good bacteria? Sterile environment? I don't think yeah. we have a sterile environment. No, but, well, but I think what she means is the more that we're using the sanitizers and we're constantly washing our hands. Oh, you mean now in the COVID, in the COVID, COVID uh, time, yeah. reality? Yeah, yeah, of course. Certainly, without any doubt. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is that. And, and Alejandro uh, uh, showed one of our papers about social uh, sociability and all what we're doing now in our social isolations and lockdowns is probably not good for our, uh, our microbiome. Um, what, I would, what I would add there is that if you have a pet, you're probably doing better in terms of microbial diversity. Yeah. Thanks to your pet. Especially a dog. Yeah, especially a dog, exactly. But social isolation and this... Uh, 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 sterility that we're being forced to live in is not good for your bacteria. Not good at all. Yeah. Well, that, that's something new to hear tonight. Um, I'm just going to we'll keep going back around then. Does Hannah have the next question? Um, yep. Someone, a, ver a very proactive member of the audience, an anonymous attendee asked, can we volunteer for participation in the large scale studies being carried out? I guess in Cork, I'm sitting in the Netherlands. So once we set up a, a collaboration, yeah, and we um, can. <laughs> we need to get. We don't have any funding at the moment in the area of ADHD. So one of the things that we're always looking at is is, is ways to get funding. And and yeah. Irish, Irish funders are conservative uh, in 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 areas that they have. But it is something that we would like to do. And if we do recruit people, we would be happy to, to recruit people from all, from all over the country uh, into our studies uh, overall. Um, and it's something that, you know, we're, we, we would like to do. And collaborating, like the, the great thing about this this field is that it is very collaborative and we can, mm -hmm. the, the more subjects you have in, 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 in studies, uh, the better you're getting a richness of data out of it. So, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, um, uh, on the advisory team of Alejandro's um, uh, consortium, and you know these consortia, the European consortia, are really good for uh, making networks. And you know we are very good in 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 this field for linking in with each other and uh, absolutely collaborating. So we talked with Ken uh, when we met. We talk about this, trying to set up something in Ireland, and, and Ken explained to me the you know the limitations and the difficulties that at that time were were happening. So. But the, the idea is there, and, and now that we're closer uh, in our in the work we do together with John, I think that the possibilities of this happening are are, are really really high. But the question also remind me something that, uh, in terms of participation, uh, we have a, a, a more or less ongoing study that investigates adults uh, with ADHD, and 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 uh, the 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 reception of our research in the in the in people and patients is so amazingly, incredibly fantastic that we always have like three to four times more applications of people with ADHD compared to people without. So, so I, uh, I want to thank this anonymous person for their interest on in this. That's what keep us, keeps us going. Okay. Um, certainly, I mean, it is a conversation we can have you know, afterwards in terms of how we can build uh, additional research around this. And if anybody out there has a very, very large checkbook, uh, talk to me or John. Um, in terms of the- Or also if you're talking to your politicians when they're next going, because mm -hmm. basic research gets lost in, in, mm -hmm. in the potholes down the road that needs fixing. Mm -hmm. um, we need to really invest in, and that's what COVID has told us, that w when you invest in science, uh, uh, things will emerge and, and, and then politicians need to know that. And, and that, that's always mm -hmm. one of the things. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for that. Um, just we keep on just going around the team there. So um, I think Hannah will be has the next question. Um, yeah, I think this one was touched on as well. Uh, and another anonymous attendee is asking, are there any studies on the effect of ADHD medication like Ritalin and Stratera on gut microbes? And can you support your gut while taking this medication? 
So it's an excellent question. About a quarter of all drugs in pharmacies affect your, the, the, the microbiome negatively. Um, uh, and the, that's quite striking. We haven't worked, worked on these two medications, but we've worked on antidepressants and antipsychotics and other psychotropic medications and shown that they have maybe some of the side effects maybe be mediated through what's going on in the microbiome. So we would encourage people to try and, uh, you know, increase their, their fiber and, and fermented food intake would be the easiest way uh, to try and do that uh, overall. We are investigating that question together with some colleagues in, in, um, in, um, Spain and some colleagues in Brazil. We're looking at people that have, haven't received any medication. They are then diagnosed and then we, we, we are investigating the microbiota profile. Then they will get the medication because that's a protocol, right? That is the way to, to, to deal with this uh, for those who accept it. And then uh, we, we are trying to determine what type of changes in order to see the degree of effect uh, probably will affect the microbiota profile. I mean, our initial findings, even though we had a very small sample, didn't show any 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 effect. But um, I'm not that sure about those findings yet, because again, our, our study sample was very small. Um, but this is a very re relevant question, very relevant. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, and obviously, that is something that does affect, you know. Uh, people listening into the webinar tonight that they will either be parents of children with ADHD um, or adults themselves with the condition. Um, just the next question, I think uh, Terry's ready to go with that one. Yep, okay, so one of the first questions we had. Dietary interventions, surely we have to put this information out there for GPs and hospitals, etc., to encourage breastfeeding. Our rates are so low that this could be a huge influence rather than... Yeah, I, I, I think breastfeeding is, uh, you know, and, and, and there's been a number of studies out of UCC where we've shown the positive effects of breastfeeding. What people don't realize is that human breast milk has the highest complexity of, of sugars than any, than about 20 times more complex than, than cow's milk. And these sugars are not broken down by the infant. I mean, this is, for me, when I heard this, it was quite mind blowing. They're, they're, bro they're actually broken down by the microbes. And they're broken down by the microbes into chemicals, one of which is like sialic acid, which supports brain development. So if you don't have the microbes uh, um, and, and you don't get the sugars, you know, it's that disconnection. And this is co-evolution. So we, we've kind of handed over this job of, of, for, for, of, uh, uh, of creating these chemicals to the microbes, uh, but we need the breast milk to, to, to actually work on it. And so that, that's really, you know, why early life is so critical and supporting um, breastfeeding as much as possible is really key uh, within uh, what we're trying to do. But again, you know, it it it, 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 it it needs to be as part of a global public health message uh, overall. I, I would I would add to that that it's like with diet, right? Uh, it's better to do it than not to do it. But does it mean that if you don't do it, that that is a cause mm -hmm. of ADHD? So that's not what we're saying here, right? I, I think I we're, we're saying that it's better if you can do it, do it. Because that will help in many, many ways. It will help with the development of the brain. It will help with the immune system. It would help with growth. Um, uh, but for many reasons, people cannot do it. And that doesn't mean that you are causing that your child will get it. And I want to, to make that clear because sometimes it might, people might think, okay, I, I didn't breastfeed my child and maybe it's my fault or something like that. Yeah. No, no. Uh, and I want to make that very, very clear because we're talking about uh, disentangling something that is very complex that we think has a biological relationship with what this, this thing we call ADHD. And one point I want to make very clear is that ADHD is not one monolithic thing, right? It, clinically, people are grouped into that, but biologically, that is not the case. There is diversity, heterogeneity within this group. And what is true for some is not true for others. Yeah. And given that the, 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 the bacterial profiles are so diverse and this ecosystem is so complex, the effects of this, the ones we're di discovering now are the bigger ones, you know? The, 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 easier, the easier to find, but that doesn't mean that they are the only ones. But of course, I agree completely with John. You should, if possible, breastfeeding always as a, as a social, uh, public health uh, issue, a uh, healthy issue, but again, it, some people cannot do it. It doesn't mean that it's yeah, going to yeah. be a cause of it, right? 
Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, as I say, I mean, there is a couple of the, the chat just exploded there, and I think uh, the, the leading comment is uh, I breastfed my ADHD child for three and a half years. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody can beat that yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it won't turn into a competition. Um, but we'll go straight to the next question from Tricia. It says, um, can you give any sense of what pro proportion of our microbiome is inherited and what is environmental and the extent to which it changes during our life? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I mean, in, strictly speaking, it's not inherited. Strictly speaking, right? You get it from your mother at birth. So it's not inherited in the formal sense like genetics. Okay? So in order to put words a little bit in, in, in the correct place, I think. Having said this, there is data showing that the, there is a genetic uh, uh, component that explains the variability of the microbiome, meaning that the microbiota is also heritable, meaning that that distribution that we will get, we don't know is if, uh, if it's after the first thousand days or after the first five years, uh, uh, but that distribution after it becomes more or less stable is also explained by genetic factors. Meaning what, what John was talking about before this coevolution between the host and the bacteria. Because your genes will, of course, produce substances that will favor specific distribution over other. And that, in that sense, there is a communication, very hard, very strong communication between our genes and the genes of the bacteria. But strictly speaking, it's not an you're not inheriting them. But you're receiving those that will probably accommodate best for you because you're getting, you know, half of your genes from your mother and her microbiota, at least when you're born. Okay, thank you. And we are pushed up against time, but um, I have to say, you know, just in terms of, we're not getting through all the questions. Um, and again, we'll probably be here till half 10 tonight if we were to do so. Um, but obviously, um, if you have your permission, maybe we'll just go five, 10 minutes over, maybe just do one more round of questions from the team here. Um, just maybe just drop in one for myself there. I just came in from Yvonne Murphy. Um, we cook specific meals, healthy meals for the kids. Uh, we know that they like to eat them. Then we freeze them and reheat them in the microwave. Would that negatively affect the microbes? No. Very quickly, that's good. Not, not, no, no, uh, not at all. So, no, well, that's great. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, I think uh, Nicola now has the next question. Nicola needs to mute uh, herself. You're muted. Nice to keep me quiet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a, mess, uh, a, a question here from Michelle. Actually, two of them I'm going to combine together. Um, many kids with ADHD have bowel issues. Um, and do you think that uh, moving forward, when we're further down the line and we have more evidence around this, that possibly um, that there is a fecal transplant would be, be potential treatment in the future? Yeah, I, I, I think so in the future, like the issue with fecal transplants is, is always going to be about safety. There is one small study showing beneficial effects both on behavioral and bowel problems in, in autism. Um, um, it's a small, it's not blind, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's promising, but it's not enough uh, overall. Um, I, 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 it'll be, it'll be interesting because the question about when do you give it, like, you know, when, you know, uh, and, yeah, exactly. uh, and the timing and, you know, what do you give and it's going to be complicated. It is disrupting what we think there, there is some beneficial effects seen now in, in irritable bowel syndrome and some studies and in inflammatory bowel disease. So potentially, potentially the link with, 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 with the gut problems is, is, is also um, becoming more evident and, uh, and th that everything is connected and comorbid in, in terms of how this gut brain axis is working. And, and uh, you know, it, 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 is, it, it does become challenging. I mean, someone asked there in the chat and about like, you know, this is interesting from a science perspective, but what, you know, what do you say to, to a parent with a, with a kid? And, 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 and that's really an important aspect about, about all of this is, is what, where is the science right now in terms of, of uh, uh, giving any, any type of advice? All I, 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 just like neurodiversity is, 
is is really key. Uh, diversity in the gut is really key. And so, uh, the, you know, if, if the, you can get a kid to tolerate increasing fiber and increasing fermented foods, um, often they're picky eaters, so it may not be the easiest things, but that would be my advice before I would go down the route of fecal transplants or other things. Okay. Yeah, the, the, besides the point of, of when, which is key, <laughs> I, I, I would like to add that uh, we have not been able yet to calculate how much of the let's say of ADHD is explained by the bacteria. We don't know that yet. Therefore, we need to weigh the benefit of doing that versus how much we could potentially solve. Uh, it's not a trivial issue, eh? So, so I completely agree with what John just said. Perhaps we should we should just explore and, and, and use better dietary products, change the diet a little bit, you know, and, and, and probably that will also have a, a beneficial effect on, on at least part of the behavior. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And just before we go on to the next one, uh, the question from Hannah, um, Nicola, you know, we've, we use the chat here between you and ourselves and Nicholas put all this one in caps, which means if I don't do it, I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> Can you just ask John particularly and uh, Alexandro, um, will the papers detail, when will the papers be available and can people get a copy of the presentations afterwards? So can so I, my, I sent you a copy of my, my, my papers there just uh, during, during the talk. So yeah. you, have, you have mine and I'm free to, uh, free to, to, to disseminate. Okay. Yeah, mine too. I, I will make a copy available for you. Can, you can, so get people, it. Can so you can distribute get... it with your... Yeah. With your well, I say we are recording, so um, people are really want to get their hands on this information afterwards. And um, let's say we just go through just maybe three or four more questions before we. I mean, fortunately, I I think we might be good to do this again in about six months. Um, just over to Hannah again for a last question from Hannah. Uh, thanks very much. Um, this one interested me because I know we've mentioned um, different medications and their effect on the microbiome. And the other thing about this question is it's quite topical with all the talk of RNA-based vaccines. So Fiona is asking about RNA vaccines, can they interfere with microbiome? So your microbiome, really one of its main jobs is to, is to keep your immune system in, 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 in check. And so anything that affects uh, how your immune system is will be moderating, but but there's no data on anything negative, and and we have lots of that we know that we've no rationale that it would be any different than any other type of vaccine, uh, and uh, the microbiome has been shown to actually support uh, vaccination uh, uptake in, and 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 immunity, uh, yeah. you know, overall. So one of the things with COVID is people are really trying to protect their because of all the sanit sanitation changes and social changes. You know, protecting your microbiome is going to be key so that you'll respond appropriately to the vaccine it will be you know yeah i agree completely there's no evidence that this would be a problem get vaccinated please get vaccinated. there you go you heard it here um just a couple more questions before we just wrap up for tonight and i'll go to the next one from terry um yeah simon says is there any research regarding fasting please yeah, so intermittent fasting and the microbiome fasting. is there is a lot of really interesting work brewing uh, early stages, but uh, it's very key. We're working on circadian rhythms in the mic. So, so your micro your microbiome isn't stable; it changes as uh, throughout the day, and so that goes into the whole fasting, maybe about time restricted eating and and things like that. So, there's it, it, that, that's a really exciting hot area right now. Nothing on ADHD yet with the microbiome in that context. Alejandro may know more. But but I um, I think it's it's really you know really important. There's some studies in in looking at Ramadan and other other extended fasting yeah. periods as well. Yeah, I, I was gonna say it also that Ramadan has been quite investigated for that. Uh, but one one of the key uh, theories uh, regarding ADHD biology uh, lies on uh, sleep disorders, and circadian rhythm of course is one of the systems involved there um, um, so so that is a good place to start looking for this um, intermittent fasting also includes you know the activation of signals related to glucose and those go also through the brain so so it might make uh, 
biological sense to look at that in, in, with respect to the microbiota, uh, either for a better response to the intermittent fasting, for example, that you could release more things or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we, don't, we don't work with intermittent fasting in our, in our group, but it probably will, will blow out soon. Um, and just maybe just one last question, and there we go to Trisha for that. Just, if I could add one thing to a currently healthy diet, what would you suggest? How old are you? Oh, Trisha. <laughs> oh, the person <laughs> asking the question. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, this is, this is yeah, Catherine Gorman is the answer to the question. We don't know how age she is. Yeah. Fiber, fiber. Yes, plant, fiber, plant definitely. Plant-based fiber, plant fiber from fruits and vegetables. Also, uh, uh, I don't. I, I mean, epidemiologically, has we, we, we know that the, uh, using fiber a very good indicator of an overall diet, good that quiet, good quality of diet. So many researchers actually use the intake of fiber as a sort of marker of how good your diet is, without actually having to measure everything. But, so diet overall, yeah, that's the it, one. The problem with it is though that some people can tolerate fibers. Yes, yeah, for people with irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease, it can be challenging. So again, like all of these questions are nuanced. There's no like we we tend to give binary answers and then someone feels bad because they can't. Uh, we don't want making anyone feel bad because of anything in relation. To it. But if you can tolerate fiber and the Irish diet, we've studied it now and looked at the fiber intake and it's criminally low compared to <laughs> what what it should be uh, well, overall. And it's not just all brand like yeah. this. You get fiber in many in many other things, uh, and you can make fiber very very good for your for your, and your microbes just love us. Well, you can also combine it with the reduction in consumption of things like you know processed food, sugar sugar uh, beverages, you know. So perhaps if fiber is not it's something that you cannot eat or you cannot eat in large quantities or whatever, you can combine that with eating less of things that are, are not that good for your microbes. Okay, thanks. Um, just before we wrap up, I'm actually going to cheat and ask a last question. And it's the shortest question we got tonight. And this one's particularly for John. And it was, why a dog? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's to do with, with movement from, uh, because they, they're, they're, they tend to be outdoors. It's the environmental aspects. They bring in a lot of the, 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 the uh, diversity of the microbes and uh, from, from, from outside in, uh, and the studies have been done. It's been mainly done in the context of allergy and researcher in, in California, Susan Lynch's group have shown particularly that dogs, uh, dog ownership was was associated with reduction in this. It goes back to farming. It goes back to the kind of revisiting the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, cats tend to not not bring in as much uh, uh, um, a diversity of, of, of microbes. So dogs are good. Cats neutral. Okay. So dogs have a fantastic immune system. Brilliant. Well, obviously, just I want to say thanks to um, Alexandro and John. What you've learned here tonight is um, eat fiber, get a dog. Um, thank you very much for what has been really a very, very entertaining education uh, uh, webinar for ourselves. You know, we've learned lots. As I say, we will record, all, it has been recorded, and uh, we will send the slides out to everybody that uh, registered for tonight. Um, and I hope everybody who's tuned in has enjoyed it. Uh, so on behalf, again, myself and ADHD Ireland and the staff of Nicola, Hannah, Terry and Tricia, thanks very much. Um, and we hope to see you again at other events going forward into the future. So thank you very much and hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Bye. Thank you. Very nice to see everyone. Alejandro, we'll see you soon, someday when we can travel again. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, John. Thank you very much for, for all of this. It was, I think it went, went very good. It was very nice. Sure. Uh, very nice audience that you guys have. Uh, people very patient, very open, well, nice I questions. If you want Thank to, you I mean, the, there's now 24 in. things in the in the chat, and they're all saying nice things about you, Alexandro. If you want to have a quick look there, 26. We're going to people well, are yeah, going home. They're leaving comments for you. We had one comment to say from from us that said, um, "This has been her favorite talk from ADHD Ireland in 20 years." There we go. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, it's a it's a high bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really enjoyed it. I, I, I really like to talk to, to, to patient groups, patient organizations, to get in touch with the real, reality of what you're looking at. Yeah.
and and for me that's very important. I, I as I told you, I I've been working in statistical genetics for I don't know twenty years, twenty odd years, and that is really far away from people. And uh, for me, that was good. It was nice. It's very nice research, very nice science. But I wanted to get closer to to the people, basically. And and this research has, has allowed me to do that. You know, so so I'm very happy with it. I'm, I'm happy to be able to share with with you and, and, and your audience in, in this way. For me, it's very good. I, I really like to do it. I okay. see someone else said immense thanks, Alejandro and John, for a fascinating presentation that was just so digestible. And they said <laughs> it's <was so> informative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, good. that's a very good comment. It's a good comment. Okay, guys, really okay. good to see you all. Meet you all. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, really. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, back to Sunny Cork. You know. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Now, Thanks. Once more, good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody. It was Bye. very nice to meet you all. Bye. Bye.